Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to this wonderful event on this beautiful Canberra day. My name is Roxanne Missingham, and I'm the University Librarian, and it's my privilege to introduce Mark for this public lecture. We started ANU with a welcome to country, where we acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. The ANU Library and China in the World are delighted to be working together on a series of events. There was a lecture last year, this year. I think we're going to have to turn it into an annual <laughs> series, Ben, um, where we are keen to engage the community, the uh, Canberra community as well as the ANU community, um, on issues intellectual relating to Chinese study. We were very fortunate to sign a memorandum of understanding with the National Central Library um, from Taiwan and we have established a Taiwan uh, Chinese Resource Centre which you will see in the front of the library on your way out and we do that in support of the fantastic work that is done by scholars at the university particularly by those under Ben's purvey at the Australian Centre of China and the world where they all obey him instantly, rush to publish and anything else that he tells them to do. <laughs> Yes, that was, that was our ringing endorsement. And it was Ben that recommended that we invite Mark Harrison to speak to us at our lecture this year. And it was deferred for health reasons, but we are delighted to see that Mark is well enough to arrive in Canberra, sit in the sunshine, and then fly back to Tasmania. <laughs> but that's okay. Mark has a BA Honours in Chinese from the University of Adelaide and completed his PhD in Monash University looking at Taiwan and its problems of identity. From 2002 to 2008, he worked as research fellow and lecturer at the Centre for the Study of Democracy at the University of Westminster in London, UK. His work examines knowledge and representation in Chinese con contexts, exploring contemporary cultural and social life in Taiwan and mainland China. His current po project is entitled China's Futures. I was uh, really fortunate this morning to have read two of his book chapters which are in ANU Press publications on identity and they are extraordinary works that combine an understanding of social culture, of political culture, of Chinese culture, and they were a real pleasure to read. So I encourage all of you, after you've heard his lecture, to not go and buy the book, go and read the book chapters. They are well worthwhile. But on that note, uh, I might hand over to you, Mark, and thank you so much for coming to give this lecture. Oh, well, thanks, Roxanne, for that introduction, and uh, thanks uh, for the invitation to come up and talk. Um, it's always a pleasure to come to the ANU, obviously, and um, uh, and this is a really nice occasion to uh, um, uh, to say something about um, my current thinking about Taiwan. In fact, so this paper is about Taiwan, um, and it's about its history, and I guess we can call it its contemporary challenges. I'm trying to say something about um, the way the past lives in the present in Taiwan. Um, but also how the present is shaping the past. The past is being kind of reimagined in, uh, in contemporary Taiwan. And the meaning of the past is being um, transformed in, I think, uh, quite radical and unexpected ways. So a lot of this material uh, comes from a visit uh, that I made to Taiwan, um, thanks to the generosity of the Australian Centre on China and the World in June. So I travelled uh, south. Um, I saw a number of um, very interesting places and I'm trying to um, uh, build on, on what I was seeing and, and, and shape it into an argument. So what I'm going to be talking about in the second half of this talk is um, mostly about Green Island, uh, which is off the coast of uh, southeast uh, Taiwan, and the uh, Green Island Human Rights Memorial Park, which includes the New Life Re-Education Camp um, and the Ministry of National Defence Green Island Reform and Re-Education Prison, also known as Oasis Villa. And uh, the histories of these buildings and these sites which overlap um, and have uh, changed in very complex and, uh, and surprisingly indeterminate ways over many decades. Um, they express a shifting, um, they are shifting expressions of the institutionalization of authoritarianism in Taiwan during the martial law period, the eventual transition to democracy in the 1980s and 90s, and now the memorialization um, and uh, the, the subjectification, if you like, of national memory in Taiwan. 
I'll first say, before I get into all of that, that saying anything about Taiwan is very, very difficult. I think anyone who tries to write about it faces this challenge. Uh, the name Taiwan itself um, is an unstable category. Um, the history of Taiwan slips between many different histories. So it, um, it includes uh, the civilizations of the Pacific. Uh, there's Dutch imperial history in the 17th century. Uh, there's China's imperial and national histories. Uh, China, Taiwan is um, between the demise of the Qing and the founding of the Republic, the Chinese Civil War and the founding of the People's Republic. And over all of that, of course, is um, Taiwan's central place in Japan's imperial and wartime history. So there's a multitude of ruptures that Taiwan sort of sits um, across. Out of all of that, um, Taiwan has been delivered, as it were, into the Chinese-speaking world. And it finds itself as an object of scholarship um, often within Chinese studies. And, um, and I wanted to respond to uh, the, uh, the, the program of, of um, uh, Taiwan Chinese studies um, with just some comments. Um, Taiwan has a place, you could call it, in, in the corner of what I refer to as the cartographic practices of, Ch of Chinese studies. So one of the things that Chinese studies does is um, it defines the meaning of China, but it's also defined by the meaning of China. So the way I phrase this in another setting is it hesitates between the passive and the active. Um, it's Chinese studies is a very complex um, body of scholarly work. Um, in that context, as a kind of carto cartographic practice, the sort of making of a, map, a scholarly map, as it were, um, Taiwan has a really complicated and interesting place. Um, in the words of Homi Baba, who's one of my favourite writers, uh, Taiwan is uh, its slippage, its excess, its difference that reveals some strategic limitation or prohibition within the authoritative discourse itself. So there's something about Taiwan within the Chinese world that sort of speaks against the center that somehow is more Chinese than China and somehow fundamentally not Chinese at all. It's all of those things simultaneously. It illustrates really powerfully um, the, the, the instability of, of the, the category of China, um, but it also sheds an enormous amount of light on what it means to do Chinese studies. Taiwan's presence um, as an object of knowledge is interstitial, therefore. So any analysis of Taiwanese culture, um, of its society, its politics, these are all necessarily, by definition, attempts to fix its meaning as something. And when you try and do that, uh, you interpose identity <coughs> politics and political ideologies. So once you start talking about um, Taiwan as a thing unto itself, you're immediately embedded in really, really complicated uh, um, uh, uh, contemporary geopolitics and identity politics. And Every interposition of, 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 um, uh, of, of scholarly work invites further explication. There's a really recursive quality to trying to say something about Taiwan. And so you're pulled into a kind of recursion that destabilizes the category Taiwan itself. So it's just an incredibly difficult thing to write about. Um, I always feel when I try and talk about Taiwan, you've got to spend the first um, sort of half a page or page um, just trying to stabilize the category just before you can go on and say anything. Of course, there's a very particular institutional response to this at a, in a, a, at a global level, which is the rejection of Chinese studies um, altogether and the creation of something called Taiwan studies. And so there's um, well-established organizations in North America and in Europe um, who understand Taiwan as a scholarly category unto itself, completely different from Chinese studies. Um, I'm actually quite ambivalent about that move, to be honest. Um, I think Taiwan does have a place in Chinese studies. It depends on how, again, how you define Chinese studies. Um, and uh, Taiwan studies as a, as a body of knowledge unto itself can also be a little inward looking, a little, um, uh, a little closed off. It can be a little too green. Can I say, use that term in the, in the, the Taiwan politics sense? Um, I'll now, uh, having said all of this about uh, the nature of Taiwan, about trying to locate it within Chinese studies, I will um, give a brief summary of Taiwanese history. Um, I, I have occasionally tried not doing this. Um, the last time I tried it, uh, the first question was, could you please just give a summary of Taiwanese history? Um, the history isn't well known, and so it is useful to just sort of track through it. So Taiwan, as many of us know, um, has an indigenous peoples. Um, they're members of what um, is evocatively known as uh, the civilization of the voyaging canoe. Uh, these are people who sailed across the Pacific on gigantic ocean-going canoes, and they started in Taiwan and they settled the entire Pacific. Uh, Taiwan was a Dutch colonial territory in the 17th century between the Ming and the Qing. Um, 
and its Chinese history begins with the Zhen Changgong Interregnum from 1662 to 1683, which was a short-lived kingdom loyal to the Ming Dynasty. And that was defeated um, by the Qing uh, in 1683, and Taiwan was brought under central uh, imperial authority as a prefecture of Fujian, actually. Um, and that was actually the first really official um, imperial authority exercised over Taiwan. Um, it achieved its own provincial status in 1885, and then in 1895, of course, it was ceded by the Qing to Japan as a colony as a result of the 1894 Sino-Japanese War. Um, the story of, of Japanese colonial Taiwan is an extraordinarily fascinating one, which I won't go into, I'm happy to. Um, as all of this is going on in Taiwan, of course, uh, the Qing Empire collapsed in 1911, the Republic of China was founded and then the Chinese Communist Party was founded in 1921, and the mainland entered a period of civil war. Um, at the end of World War II, Taiwan was returned or um, was given um, to the governance of the Republic of China, led by the KMT or the Chinese Nationalists, uh, as a province. It became a province of the Republic of China. Um, and in 1947, the single most important event in modern Taiwanese history occurred uh, the 228 uprising where the Taiwanese rose up against Chinese nationalist rule and their rebellion was crushed with um, really extraordinary violence um, and that violence has echoed um, absolutely to the present. Um, and out of that violence a Taiwanese nationalist movement emerged um, with a political structure, an ideology, a nationalist historiography, all of the things that inform contemporary Taiwanese politics today. And then, of course, in 1949, the national government of the Republic of China relocated to Taipei, fleeing from the advancing communists who founded the People's Republic of China. The post-49 history is, uh, which I'll, I won't, I'll just sketch broadly, it is germane to my argument, um, is told in a very particular way in, in, uh, by policymakers, scholarship um, in the Anglosphere and by the Taiwan government. And it's been told in this way for many years. Uh, so under US hegemony, which Taiwan fell under as a result of the outbreak of the Korean War, it was drawn into the bipolar geopolitics of the Cold War. It became free China. Um, and it also became, as a matter of policy, a model province that the KMT were using as an exemplar to inspire uh, the, uh, the, the, the Chinese suffering under the yoke of communism on the mainland. Um, and it became, through the 50s, the very exemplar of a post-World War II um, developmental state. Uh, the 50s were developmental economics of the period, so um, land reform, the land to the tiller program, industrial policy, capital controls, import substitution. But then in 1960, uh, the Taiwan government implemented um, what at the time was a radical program, but we would now call it the prototype of neoliberalism. So free capital controls, privatization, um, foreign investment, um, deregulation, many things like that. Um, and it laid the foundation for the Taiwan economic miracle. Um, and so the Taiwanese economy began just to accelerate at an incredible speed from 1960 up until uh, the early 1990s. It became an Asian, ti excuse me, an Asian tiger. <coughs> of course, right through this period, Taiwan is also a military dictatorship. It has a terrible human rights record. Um, and as the economy is going um, incredibly successfully, uh, activists were testing the limits of state power constantly. Uh, they're agitating for democratic reform. And then Taiwan entered a post-industrial phase uh, of its hyper growth in the 1980s. And its politics shifted and it began a transition to democracy. So the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party, was founded in 1986. Martial law lifted in 1987. And then there was a series of really complex constitutional reforms in the early 90s, which um, enabled democratic elections for the office of president of the Republic of China by the residents of the island of Taiwan but also kept the peace across the Taiwan Straits. I think um, uh, we would do well to look at that story in the early 90s and recognize how the subtlety and the sophistication of that constitutional reform laid the groundwork for um, prosperity in the region and certainly Australia's prosperity, because it could have gone horribly wrong if they got it wrong. And the 1990s, um, uh, in the 2000s, the Taiwan story, as we know, has been um, the consolidation of its democratic system. So the presidential election starting in 1996, every four years, and the legitimization of Taiwanese identity. So that with the DPP, um, uh, Taiwanese identity politics are part of the political landscape. 
So Taiwan's democracy has um, been lauded as an example, as an exemplar of third wave democratization, to use the political science term. It's also the, foundations of, uh, the foundation of Taiwan's security. It's the thing that, that keeps Taiwan safe, ultimately. And in Taiwan, you have democracy, uh, democratic sovereignty and nationhood, rights and subjectivity, Taiwanese subjectivity and capitalism. All of these different things are intertwined in Taiwan today into a coherent and very powerful story. And the, this way of, the, the way of telling this story is um, structured not just by the story of modernization, which it is, but of modernity itself. You know, Taiwan is an exemplar of modernity in a really, um, really foundational sense. And of course, it stands as radically different to communist modernization on the mainland uh, as created by the People's Republic of China, which has its own, it's a, an entirely different pathway of, of, of modernity and modernization. <coughs> it's also, I think, um, has overlapped with and contested with, on Taiwan itself, the vision of post-imperial uh, nationalist modernization of the Republic of China. Because we can forget that uh, in the very early decades of the ROC, there was a vision of, of nationalist modernization, which is actually quite different from what the Taiwanese ended up creating. Um, and these things overlap and contest. And that contestation has driven Taiwan's extremely volatile and very uh, bitter partisan politics. Um, it's often within Taiwan, within its own uh, public debate, is uh, this is often framed as uh, incomplete democratic consolidation. There's this idea that all of this contestation means that Taiwan hasn't just quite hasn't quite yet achieved a fully um, cohered democratic system. Um, people also talk about um, the, a public sphere that is insufficiently rational. That's often a term that Taiwanese people use. Uh, it's prone to emotion rather than sober technocratic progress. And of course, this is part of how the Blues and the Greens, uh, the KMT and the DPP, um, engage in, their, in their, uh, their, their political contestation. The story is always fairly familiar, I think, to many of us. Um, I, I, one of the things that's come to me uh, in, in the last few years is that um, although there is this very familiar story which informs Taiwanese politics, in the last decade or so, and I, um, it's sort of maybe three or four years ago that I started to really get a sense of this, that on the margins of this, this uh, um, this modern Taiwan, um, particularly in the world of art, writers, <coughs> artists, um, activists, uh, there's a distinctive, um, something particularly and distinctive has entered Taiwan's public sphere, which I generally categorize as a kind of malaise or a kind of anxiety. There's a very particular tone that you get when you talk to Taiwanese people about modern Taiwan and where it's going, and it's framed in this very curious way. Um, it's present in art and culture in Taiwan. It hovered over the sunflower movement, I think, very particularly. It also hovered over and it, was, um, it flowed through the presidential election campaign last year, where I think people, um, uh, people felt a strange sense that things weren't quite right. It's also present, and this certainly came to me on the trip that I made in the middle of the year, was um, what has come to be the extraordinary fixation that the Taiwanese have come to have on their history. So Taiwan today is drowning in history. Uh, history, memory, and nostalgia. Um, it is art, urban development, museums, memorials. These are proliferating from one end of the island to the other. And I'll come back to this point at the very end. Um, so things, so, so structures, for example, that you know, even 10 years ago, certainly 20 years ago, old Japanese colonial structures or, or um, nine, I think buildings from the 50s that would have been demolished you know, to make way for factories and apartment buildings, every single one of them nowadays is being turned into an arts precinct or a cultural zone or just something in which art and memory and history is given a kind of space to, to, uh, to, to occupy. Um, there's a sense that the very foundations of the story of Taiwanese modernity are being rewritten or rethought on the margins. And it's introducing a kind of doubt about the integrity of Taiwan's experience of modernity that's seeping and coursing through Taiwan's body politic. So I argued elsewhere um, a little while ago that um, what is driving this, I think, is a recognition that the story of Taiwan as a story of modernity and modernization uh, has effaced um, what is its most fundamental and foundational characteristic, which is violence. 
So at the center of the Taiwan story that uh, the, the, the received narratives do not address is an experience of violence. And when I say violence, I mean political violence, the violence of the martial law period, but I'm also thinking emotional violence, the damage done to every family. There's not a family across the island that has not had some impact from, especially the martial law period, uh, that has played um, and has uh, exercised legacy in, in their family history. Also environmental violence, I think that's a key element of, um, of damage to the environment through this, this breakneck modernization. There's a sense in which um, violence has not been accounted for. And uh, on the margins of, of, of uh, uh, the consensus discourse uh, are people wanting somehow to account for it and of trying to find a way to do that. Um, this I think has been validated uh, this year in two particularly interesting ways. One was uh, the announcement by the new president, President Tsai Ing-wen, of the formation of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which she made it in her inauguration speech. Um, and also her apology to Taiwan's indigenous people, uh, which uh, she gave a few months ago. Uh, both of these are really important uh, moments of the state um, facing a history of violence. Um, but of course, this process has only begun as far as the state is concerned. Um, and so I think Taiwan has entered a really, really complicated uh, period. What I want to do now is then try and draw out what that means and try and draw out what if Taiwan has a history of violence, how does that actually work? How can we, we um, understand it? What does it actually mean in terms of, of people's lives and, and, and politics and culture? Um, so history lives in the present. So this history of violence lives in the present, but it arrives transformed. It doesn't arrive um, just as it was. It's, it's transformed by politics and, and moral forces. So I want to trace one particular fragment of history and try and say something about the way it has been rendered and it has been re-rendered in the present. And this is where I want to talk about Green Island. So off the southeast coast of Taiwan, um, it's an hour ferry ride from Taidong if you're brave enough, because you're sailing out into the Pacific Ocean and it's, it's re reasonably terrifying, I have to tell you. Um, Green Island is a volcanic atoll. Um, there's a road around it, which is 18 kilometers uh, in, in total length. Um, the weather facing the Pacific is extraordinarily rugged. Um, uh, during the Japanese era, Green Island uh, was known as Kaishoto, which is Burned Island. Um, and it's an appropriate name, I can say, um, because it's very, very harsh in the summer. Uh, there was a prison on um, the Green Island in the Japanese period. Um, in 1945, the island was renamed Luta, or Green Island, by um, uh, Taiwan's KMT government. And in 1951, uh, having been saved by the Korean War, uh, uh, the, the, the Chinese nationalists, they established their own prison on Green Island for political prisoners. Um, the New Life Correction Centre operated from 1951 until 1965, and the Ministry of National Defence Green Island Reform and Re-Education Prison, known as Oasis Villa, or Lujo Sanzhuang, operated from 1972 to 1987. Um, the original buildings of um, the New Life Correction Centre from the 50s are now mostly gone. There are some kind of um, stone and concrete shells. There's some, some foundations that remain. Um, Oasis Villa is mostly intact um, and it's been restored and maintained. And of course, now it's a, uh, now it's a museum. Um, there are later buildings though, which were being built on this, this quite large site um, in the 1970s, right up until the mid 80s. Um, and these buildings are mostly derelict, including this one. Uh, the history of these buildings is very complicated. There are many uh, institutions played across their management and their construction. Um, the, uh, the derelict buildings include the library where Major Guo Ting Liang was, uh, he worked as the, um, the head of the library. He was a, a major in the army who was associated with um, a, supposedly a coup attempt against Chiang Kai-shek organized by General Sun Liran. And uh, Sun Liran spent the rest of his life under house arrest, but uh, Guo Ting Liang ended up spending most of his life on Green Island from 1955 until 1988. And of course, he died in very mysterious circumstances in 1991 um, when he fell from a train. So these uh, buildings and their histories blur into each other. The boundaries of the prison sites constantly shifted over these decades. Uh, there was construction of new buildings, new administrative structures. The legal and penal system of, the martial, of martial law also developed over um, 
many decades. And I can say, you know, having investigated this in a great deal of detail, there's actually contradictory accounts of which building belongs to which and, and who, who, who managed what and when everything was built and what exactly everything was for. In the martial law period, all of these buildings were part of a complex of military, security, legal and incarceration institutions that operated in sites right across Taiwan. So there's in Taipei, in, in Xindian, in Taidong and on Green Island. And they oversaw an opaque system across Taiwan of surveillance, mili secret military trials of dissenters, their uh, detention and their transportation and their incarceration, and their ideological re-education. So all of these buildings, um, uh, and including their construction and their decay in a way, are one expression of what ultimately by the 1980s had become a vast state economy of authoritarianism. And this is a vast enterprise. This is uh, ministries and bureaus and organizations and thousands and thousands of people managing this system. It's an economy of authoritarianism. It's also an economy of violence. Um, it's institutionalized violence. It's very, um, it's very elaborate by the 1980s. By the mid 80s, however, as, as politics began to shift, um, that economy itself was starting also to shift into something that we would recognize more as a kind of civic justice and penal system. So Oasis Villa was um, reorganized in 1987 and um, uh, there were new buildings built uh, in 19, from 1985 to 1987. Um, the site of um, uh, the, the, all of the site was transferred from the Ministry of National Defense to the Ministry of Justice. And um, some of the buildings and a new uh, complex was constructed called the Green Island Vocational Training Center. And that was intended to train prisoners for life after prison. It had a much more kind of um, conventional prison function as we would understand it. But many of these buildings were abandoned in 1992. Um, and ultimately uh, an entirely new prison was built a bit further down the road, which is still there. There's a, there's a, a real prison there. I walked up to the gates and I was told under no uncertain terms that I needed to turn around and walk away. Um, and um, uh, so a lot of these buildings were abandoned in 92. But then in 97, a campaign began, a political campaign, to restore the buildings and to recognize that they had historic value and to turn them into sites of remembrance. And then they began to transition away from the Ministry of Justice to uh, the, the National Tourism Bureau and then ultimately to the Ministry of Culture. Uh, it was Shu Mingde, a very famous uh, na um, democracy and, and Taiwanese nationalist activist who led that campaign in 97. Um, so from the, the late 90s, um, the structure of Taiwan's engagement with its past began to change, it began to take on a new form. So this dispersed economy of state violence, this dispersed economy of, viol of, of authoritarianism was re-territorialized, as it were, to what I'm calling an economy of memory. And I'll come back to what I mean by that. So the Green Island Human Rights Memorial was constructed um, just on the coast, um, opposite Oasis Villa in 1999. In 2002, the Taiwan government designated the entire site as a memorial um, and it became the Green Island Human Rights Culture Park. Since 2012, the site has largely fallen under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Culture. And again, this expresses this really complicated institutional transformation, uh, transformation from Ministry of National Defense, Ministry of Justice to the Ministry of Culture, from the militarist to the politico-juridical to the socio-cultural. Um, I say largely under the Ministry of Culture because um, there's also the Green Island Municipal Government, there's the Taidong uh, Tourism Authority and the Taidong County Government, all of whom essentially fight over um, the management of this site um, in ways that are interesting. Uh, today, Oasis Villa is a museum site, and as is the New Life Correction Centre. Um, there's a museum building uh, in the New Life Correction Center which has dioramas and, um, and a map and a kind of diag like a model of, of the original uh, prison site. Um, it's got displays describing the very difficult daily lives of uh, the prisoners. Um, uh, it, um, like the Jingmei Human Rights Museum in tai Taipei, it makes much use of the names of the inmates. There's a number of locations where every single name is inscribed in one form or another. On the literal boundary of the two sites, the New Life Correction Center and Oasis Villa, um, are derelict buildings that were occupied until 1992 and include some of the buildings um, that were used for uh, the vocational training center. 
And these buildings are subject currently to a Ministry of Culture Restoration Plan, which was written last year. Um, but it seemed to me that their symbolic decay, um, or their decay or their actual decay, symbolically represented the incomplete um, restoration of Taiwan's history of violence. So in one of the derelict buildings in the New Life Correction Centre is a mess hall, which is this one here. And on the walls are painted slogans offering um, uh, aphorisms for moral education. So some of them are, are well-known Cheng Yu. There's um, Zi Chang, so you know, um, self-reliance is one of them. Um, but there are a couple here, which you can see on the back, which will be immediately recognisable to any native Chinese speaker as um, adaptations of some of the sayings of uh, Zhu Bo Lu, uh, Master Zhu, and his Maxims for a Well-Managed Household, which is a document written at the very early Qing period. Um, and the one that is there says, with every bowl of gruel or rice, you should recall that its production is not easy. Uh, with half a length of silk or hemp, always remember that to make things is very hard. Um, and so Zhu Bo Lu wrote, he was a late Ming moralist and a writer, and his uh, text, Zhu Zha Gu Yang, or the Maxims for the Well-Managed Household, has 53 maxims on daily living. Um, I've got some of them here. If taxes are paid early, then although one's purse be light, one will feel great satisfaction. Mm -hmm. um, to be humble before people who are older and more experienced will serve uh, in time of trouble. Valuing wealth but slighting parents is, an, is unbefitting a son, etc., etc., etc. These maxims are some of the most widely produced um, examples of popular Confucian, uh, Confucianism. And they're part of a Chinese imaginary and they crop up everywhere. They're in almanacs and they're in um, lots of different, you find them in lots of different forms, in temples, all kinds of things. Um, and they're part of a Chinese imaginary, an encompassing worldview of language, phraseology, meaning and textual practice that seeps into a Chinese every day and becomes naturalized and normalized in people's lives. And knowing these, these phrases and, and being familiar with them, just recognize them, recognizing them, is part of how people feel Chinese and experience Chinese subjectivity, just through their, their familiarity with these, these phrases. And their presence in a mess hall in a military prison on Green Island is therefore entirely appropriate because it's entirely in keeping with the history of the Republic of China. The Chinese nationalists were particularly fixated on moral education as the foundation of nation building. Um, this is um, at the heart of the New Life movement in the 1930s, and they really began to develop this idea through the, the 50s and 60s on Taiwan. So the Chinese na uh, nationalists, the KMT, they mobilized these notions of moral education and they promoted them uh, in schools, in the military, the media, especially from the 1960s, actually. Uh, with the, con the cultural renaissance movement. That's where it really took off as a big thing. Um, this is what Alan Chun refers to as the culturalization of politics in nationalist China, of taking the exercise of power and investing it and legitimizing it with cultural meaning, disguising its politics as it were with, um, in this case, um, sort of hoary old popular Confucianism from the early Qing. This delivered a form of moral education legitimized by popular uh, classical Chinese culture for the purpose of nation building. It also created a distinctive national subjectivity. Um, and the, the nationalists were reactionary in a, in, a, in a technical sense. They were incredibly fixated upon communism and Taiwanese nationalism. Um, but they were also focused, as in, in a more active sense, on um, infusing nation building and national subjectivity with a, with a distinctively moral dimension. This is one of the features of Chinese nationalism and the history of the Republic of China. It has a, it has a moral, it, uh, morality is at, uh, at the heart of its uh, subject making. It's particularly striking in the context of Taiwan and its hyper growth economy. So in Taiwan, subjectivity um, is also valorized by the economically productive citizen that you get in any kind of capitalist economy. So the good person is the person who's making money and is getting a job and, and doing all that sort of stuff. Um, and the nationals, of course, reconciled these two. They understood a good citizen as someone who was both economically productive and also morally righteous in a kind of uh, slightly cheesy Confucian sense. Um, these, things, these things work together in a form of righteous nat nation building. Um, and indeed, it's perhaps not entirely surprising that the engine of Taiwan's economic growth are the so-called SMEs, the small and medium-sized enterprises, family units 
which are both sites of Confucian morality, but also sites of economic activity. So it worked particularly well for the nationalists in the, from the 50s up until the 80s. Um, so moral education in Taiwan is institutionalized in its school system, in curriculum. Uh, there were local and national essaying and speech competitions in which school children had to stand up and recite uh, popular texts like, like these ones. These texts mobilized Chinese um, uh, traditions of a particular form. So popular, conservative, and familiar classical culture. So they are all part of a, a, a process of nation building in which uh, was making a kind of Chinese every day in people's lives. It's at once familiar, but also disciplinary. It's very, you know, it's, it's, a, a, it's, it's part of the disciplining of the, of the subject. So in Green Island, of course, these maxims were visited upon the prisoners and the guards of Green Island on the, on the prison sites. In this case, relatively late. This building was built, I think, it's hard to find out, in 1985, which is why it's in this strange state. It's, it's derelict, but it's not completely um, collapsed. Um, so as the prison site was transitioning from you know, its military rule to uh, its military governance to its uh, judicial governance, um, and the message in the Messal, of course, is one of discipline and self-abnegation at the service of the state and its ideology. So these aphorisms are signifiers of an ideologically and institutionally constructed Chinese imaginary, an everyday Chineseness, and all of that sort of stuff, a Chinese worldview, but it's one that is imposed with ideological, psychological, political, and if necessary, I'm sure, violent force in that location through the institutions of authoritarianism. So what you get with um, these aphorisms then, are uh, the transmission of early Qing popular imperial culture through the, uh, the, the nation building ideology of the Republic, and then transformed um, into a particular kind of patrician banality into an economy of state violence in the martial law period. Um, the, 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 the maxims intersected with violence, of course, uh, and, they, mob and they, they mobilized this classical legacy. And in this way, the maxims uh, and these, these, um, these aphorisms are a mechanism for concealing or effacing this violence. So it's not just a, an experience of lived violence. It's, 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 um, it's a violent place. It's a place in which you're living in an economy of violence, but you're still looking at these rather cheesy patrician aphorisms, which are telling you to you know, mind every bowl of rice and every bowl of gruel that you're eating, these sort of moral, little moral tales that you're being told. So these maxims are concealing, they're, they're effacing, they're, they're doing a very particular thing in this context. Um, and I'm sure for the people who were seeing them, you could call them, they were, I'm sure they were sites of microaggressions. People would have looked at them and read them angrily. They wouldn't have just read them and said, oh yes, I must mind every bowl of rice. They would have um, felt very aggrieved at being confronted by them if they were stuck in a prison. Um, nowadays, of course, everything is very different. Uh, authoritarianism is gone. Um, Taiwan is a democracy. And the institutional transformation that this was all, uh, that, that, that um, uh, that arrived upon all of these sites happened a long time ago, which is why some of them are derelict. So what, is what this means, I think, is that the, the aphorisms now, when you see them now, um, left behind in a derelict building, have become a, a, a space that exists across multiple planes of temporality. There's a kind of series of echoes. So at the time, there were these sites of violence, these sites of aggression, that microaggressions that effaced the true nature of the violence that people were subjected to. But when you see them now, um, they're very, very different things. They've taken on a radically different sort of meaning. They're echoes. Um, they are received again from the past in the present, but they are functioning very, very differently. The violence of the past arrives in these, uh, these little aphorisms uh, through a kind of recursive double reading. So seen today, um, they are no longer um, sites of violence. They are sites of remembrance or forgetting. You can read them as an example of the Chinese every day from the early Qing. You can read them as sites of violence, but you can also read them as the transformation of those things. You can read them now as um, uh, um, artifacts that expressed the way people had to live um, 40, 50 years ago uh, on Green Island. Um, they are uh, texts that capture the notion of um, memorialization and remembrance in a very particular way. 
so um, the economy of violence that these texts once concealed has now been revealed. So you can see them and you can know everything that happened behind them. But like their meaning in the martial law period, they don't arrive as sites of remembrance or memory neutrally or naturally or unproblematically. So they're arriving embedded in a new set of institutions and that themselves create new ways and very particular ways of reading them. Um, in particular, we are being guided to read them. So the memorial sites, the museums, the restored buildings, the um, um, uh, unrestored buildings, the Jingmei Human Rights Museum in Taipei, all of these sites, all of them have a very particular and elaborated um, uh, a form of institutional guidance uh, as to the, co the correct way to read the past and understand what happened in Taiwan. So in the case of the uh, Green Island Human Rights Museum, it has a particular set of precepts. It is one, to understand history of the striving for human rights in Taiwan, to be aware of the importance of protecting the environment and to build up a culture of freedom and peace. Green Island and Jingmei and Taipei are very pedagogical in their impetus. Their specific goal in all of the material they produce is to educate the Taiwanese people in the present about the suffering of political prisoners in the past so as to avoid repeating those mistakes. That's what people say, that the guides who take you around. So the displays in the museums, uh, the projects of which there are many to record the experiences of prisoners, numerous instances of the museums where former prisoners reflect and reminisce in, in various displays. All of these are part of a narrative of survival, um, of people telling their stories uh, that is explicitly in the, museum, in the material the museums produce intended to educate the Taiwanese out of the fear that they will forget. And this is part of that anxiety. And it's not just museums, the DPP does this as well. In other words, you can see where I'm going. The, museum of, the museumification of Green, Li Green Island is itself a form of moral education. The visitor is guided through these exhibitions and the artifacts, including the ones yet to be restored, uh, the, re the recreations of the experience of prisoners, all of that sort of stuff, to come to the correct way of reading them. We're being guided through these places. So this is a form of moral education which echoes the moral education of Republican China, but it's not to create the kind of idealised national citizen of the ROC or the Republic but rather it invokes a kind of idealised uh, Taiwanese democratic citizen. And this is a very distinctive form of democratic subjectivity. This isn't the Habermasian ideal of the rational technocratic subject who sort of looks at all of the, the information and makes the most rational choice as a voter or as a, as a, a, um, as a policy maker, you know, all of those, those enlightenment traditions. This is a democratic citizen, a citizen for whom citizenship is grounded in, an, un, in a, an understanding of the moral lessons of Taiwan's struggle for democracy. And those lessons are expressed through the, sub, uh, the subjective experience of political prisoners. They are embodied and idealized through the, notion, through the, the lives of those, experience, uh, of those prisoners, through notions of forbearance, dignity, um, suffering in the face of unreasonable and uh, capricious violence. So when you see these, um, these aphorisms now, you're, you're, double, you're, you're being guided to double read them. You're being guided to recognise that what they express is the suffering of the prisoners as part of a form of moral education. So um, uh, Du Wulu's maxims, the, you know, these, these maxims for the management of a, for a well-managed household, they're available to be read as a new kind of moral lesson, um, just as they were available to be read as a kind of expression of nationalist citizenship. So, in, in conclusion, um, if Du Bolu's writing uh, in, the, uh, in its usage in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s concealed a kind of a, um, economy of authoritarian violence, what kind of economy do they conceal now? And this is my conclusion. Green Island is just one memorial site in Taiwan among dozens of memorial sites that are proliferating, as I said at the beginning. There are two 228 museums uh, in Taipei. There are multiple 228 memorials. There's a new, well, relatively new White Terror Memorial near the presidential building in Taipei. There are memorial websites. There are multiple memory projects being conducted by the Ministry of Culture, by Academia Sinica, by uh, multiple universities. Um, there's an absolute explosion of uh, cultural products, of books, of comics, movies, all of these um, uh, dealing with the past 
and uncovering, revealing, capturing, all of those things in lots of different ways. Uh, some of them are funny, some of them are mostly very, very serious. Um, there's also, as I said at the beginning, the repurposing of historic sites for creative zones and art, art precincts that steep Taiwanese contemporary art in the past, that locate contemporary art in historic locations, as it were to cleanse or sanctify the past through the ideals of artistic expression with all of the moral dimension that that captures. So all of these suggest an altogether different array of institutional economics, what might be called an economy of memory. So memory in Taiwan is not simply the public memorialization of what might, once might have been kept private uh, as a social process. Um, it isn't a few things. It isn't just like Anzac Day or um, uh, you know, the War Memorial. Um, it's an expanding array. It's, it's a proliferating, it's growing. An expanding array of institutional in, uh, arrangements that are engaging in the act of um, democratic Taiwanese, uh, excuse me, national subject making. And they're going through that as if they came in the same way that the KMT did 50 years ago. My final comment will be that this is an interesting challenge. Um, what it raised, the question that it raises ultimately is, will it really work for the Taiwanese? Will they get to the end of this process and think, well, we don't seem to have got to the, the core here. We've just sort of created another institution of moral education to, to train us to be good democratic subjects. So where will that lead? Um, I think it would lead to continuing contestation and, uh, and continuing an acrimonious and complex debate within Taiwanese society. So I'll stop there and I'll say thank you very much.